Well, if you got your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Colossians chapter 3. Yeah, I know we were in Colossians chapter 3 last week. We're going to kind of finish that up this week. Uh, But Colossians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae around 62 AD. So keep in mind, that's about 30 years after Jesus died, rose from the dead, and goes back to heaven. And in the first two chapters of Colossians, we talked about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then Paul changes gears in chapters 3 and 4, and he talks about how do we live out of that grace of Jesus? What should change about us because of who we are now in Christ? And so I want to look back just briefly at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3 at verses 1 through 4 where Paul talks about this. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So what Paul's saying here is we don't just obey rules for the sake of obeying rules. It's just not some big rule book that we follow, that we are now a new creation, that we're not who we were. And because of that, because of this new identity, because of this new status, we live a different way. Well, last week we talked about how individual Christians should live out this new life in Christ, and we also talked about how Christians should relate to one another in the context of a church. Well, this week we are talking about how Christians should relate to other people in the context of their own family and also in the context of their jobs. And to really understand what Paul is going to say here in the second half of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, you've got to have a little historical background, a little context for this. What was going on in Colossae 2,000 years ago? Colossae was a smaller city in the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, the only people that really had any real rights were free Roman men. Everybody else had very little rights. The, the father and husband in a family had near life and death authority in his own family. And really, a woman's life was determined by the men that she was around. First, her father, and ultimately, uh, then her husband. And the father could decide who his daughter married. He could actually charge a fee for someone to marry his daughter called a dowry. And so then when a woman would become married, she would then move from the authority of her father to the authority of her husband. And the husband had the legal right to really do whatever he wanted. He could manage any property she had. He could make all the decisions for her. A father had the right to legally beat his wife, beat his children. He could even in certain circumstances put them to death. He could sell his children off into slavery if he felt like the family needed more money. So Roman husbands typically used their wives basically to produce heirs and other children but there was really no love there. They, uh, a wealthy Roman man would often have several girlfriends, and they got more of his time and his attention. And, and so you have to understand the context that Paul is writing in. And if you think women and children had very little rights, slaves had even less rights in the Roman Empire. They were considered property of their masters. They could be bought and sold at will. They could be beaten, mistreated for any reason. They could even be killed for any reason whatsoever with no legal consequences. And it's in this historical context that Paul gives us these instructions at the end of Colossians 3 and the beginning of Colossians 4. And if we're honest, these instructions would have been the most shocking to Roman free men because it was going to impact them the most. Christianity brought a new love and a new compassion into the world that was unknown at that time. It was countercultural, and And so you need to understand as you go through this the context, but we'll also then talk about the context in modern society and how it applies to us. So let's look at some of these verses together. This is, uh, we'll start with verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So when the women in Colossae read this, this would not have surprised them at all. This is what their obligation was to do under the law anyway. Their husbands had near absolute authority to them. And so what Paul is saying here is do what you already have to do, but do it faithfully as unto the Lord. And and so it wouldn't have surprised them. But in modern society, this idea of submission, it feels a little less comfortable to us. But if it makes you feel any better, the next verse we looked at would shock Roman men way more than this verse bothers you. But understand here, 
Paul says, submit yourselves to your own husbands because of your relationship with Christ. He doesn't say submit yourself to your husband because your husband's an awesome dude that treats you like the princess that you are. Because most of these Roman women were not in that situation. And some of you may not be in that situation as well. Paul says, submit yourself to your own husband because of your love for Jesus. And he also doesn't say that a woman should submit to every man she meets. Or that a woman can't be a leader in business and she can't lead a team or an entire business with lots of men that follow her leadership. It's not even saying that a woman cannot and should not be the president of the United States. In fact, I think it's about time for that at this point. But here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that in the context of a family, the husband and father has a unique role of leadership, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. And when a husband and father accepts this leadership role, and he does it well in spiritual matters, the family will thrive. The, the, the Bible is really clear about this. Over and over, it talks about this idea. But also, modern studies and research back this idea up. There was a big survey done in Europe several years ago about when the, the husband is the one leading the family spiritually and when the wife is leading the family spiritually. I talked about this survey a few weeks ago in the context of our marriage series, but I think it's worth noting the results again. So this study found that if the father wasn't involved and was not committed to church, but mom was very committed to church, when kids grew up and made their own decisions and left the house, only 3% of kids were very committed to church. 60% of kids in that situation said they never went to church. But listen to how different it is when it's the father who is leading the family spiritually. When dad was very committed to church, and even if the mom didn't go to church at all, 36% of kids stayed very committed to church when they were adults. It's almost 13 times higher than when mom was committed and dad wasn't. This backs up this idea that when the man is leading spiritually in his own home, the kids take their cues from him. Dads, we are the spiritual leaders of our home. The, the question you have to ask yourself is, where are you leading your family? All right, look at verse 19. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So if you think you're bothered a little bit by verse 18, Roman men would have been shocked by verse 19. Th this idea was unheard of. The idea that they would love their wives in the way Paul is talking about was so countercultural. It went against everything that their culture told them was true. The word for love here that Paul uses, the Greek word, was agape. And agape is a perfect love. It's the same love that God has for us. It's a love that's selfless. It's a love that doesn't expect anything in return. It will serve and give with no expectation of anything back. It will continue to love even when it meets with rejection and even hate. It's a love that sacrifices. It's the love that Jesus showed us on the cross when he died for us. As husbands, we have to be willing to sacrifice everything we have, even our very lives for our wives and our family. That's the calling. That's the calling. And it would have shocked Roman men. They just couldn't have understand how it was supposed to work that way. Because it's countercultural today, too. Think about it. Romantic relationships, we generally think about them and what does it do for me? How does it feel, make me feel special? How does it make me feel wanted and needed and appreciated? But Paul's saying here that husbands should love their wives in a selfless way, where it's all about serving them and giving to them with no expectation in return. All right, look at verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. He's talking here to children that are still living at home, and he says it's godly and right for children to obey their parents. When a child grows up, leaves the, the nest, leaves the house, they're no longer under this command to obey their parents. But in that situation, the command changes. It's to honor and care for your parents. And, and think about the beauty of what Paul is setting up here. This idea that in the family, when children are young... The parents take care of the kids. When the parents are old, 
the children take care of the parents. And you can just see this idea of compassion and love coming out here. All right, look at verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. That would have also been a bit of a shock to Roman men and even Roman, uh, Roman women because you could do whatever you wanted to with your kids. But Paul is saying, don't be harsh with them. Don't be angry with them all the time. Don't be too controlling. Don't put unreasonable expectations, but instead encourage them, care for them, and love them. All right, well then, in the rest of chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 4 of Colossians, Paul is going to change gears a little and start to talk about how do Christians relate to other people in the context of our workplace. Look at Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Now you may be wondering why Paul spends several verses here talking to Roman slaves. The reason is probably because every major Roman city, if you walked around, more than 50% of the people that you ran into would have been slaves. And so a whole lot of his readers were in that situation. They were either slaves or they were indentured servants of some sort. And and so when Paul says, obey your masters and everything, all he's doing is telling them to follow the law that's already there. But think about what he's also doing. He's saying, don't focus on the difficulty. Don't focus on the hardship. Don't focus on the person who is not really treating you well. Focus on God. Think about working for God. You are doing your work for God and that there's a reward for you in heaven in that. What he's doing is he's offering them some joy and some peace in a very difficult situation that they're going through. In a modern context, this is talking to us about how we interrate, relate to our bosses at work. I think there's this idea so often that we only work just as hard as we can to stay out of trouble because we feel like we're working for an earthly boss. But Paul's saying here, that's not who you're working for. Give it all you have. Find joy and pleasure in what you do and work as if you're working for the Lord. And if you have a difficult boss, somebody that's really hard to work for, if you can understand this and live this out, that you are doing your work for Christ You're going to find a whole lot more joy and peace as you do a job that's difficult. All right, then in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul is going to change and he's going to talk now to bosses or masters. Look what he says in verse 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Paul is going so countercultural here because remember that in most of the world at that time, slaves were considered property. And Paul's saying, that's not how you look at them. They are made in the image of God. And so you need to treat them with human dignity. And in a modern context, this is saying, bosses, treat your employees fair. Give them the honor and dignity that they deserve. Also pay them a fair wage for the work that they do. All right, Paul's going to change gears again as he begins to wrap up this letter because chapter 4 is a pretty short part. Look at Colossians 4, verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. So it's this idea of devoting yourself to prayer. But what does that even mean, devote yourself to prayer? Well, the Greek word that's used here for devote yourself, that phrase, gives this idea of diligence and earnestness and consistency, that it's just woven into the fabric of who we are. And I want to be really transparent about how I've not done a good job of that Uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, Some of you may know, but uh, I've gone through probably the hardest two weeks that I've ever gone through in my life. My wife and I have had uh, a a real struggle with one of our adult children with some health issues, and she has uh, struggled with that, and our hearts have been broken. Uh, We have cried a lot. We have, on occasion, gotten upset with one another as we try to figure out what to do and how to do that. And I let it affect my relationship with God. I didn't, for several days, I didn't pray my normal morning prayers. And when Lil and I would eat or we'd eat together or separate, we wouldn't pray before the meal, which is something we just always do. 
And, and I told myself it was because we were tired and we were hurting. But I began to realize that I was kind of holding God responsible for what was going on. Deep down, without even realizing it, I think I thought God owed me better, that I deserved something more. And I was like, maybe, God, maybe you've forgotten <laughs> what I do. Like, I, I share the gospel for you. I, I planted a church. I, I preach and teach at that church and lead that church with no salary or income. Maybe you've forgotten all of that. And, and without even realizing it, that's nothing I said inside or outside, but maybe without realizing it, uh, I thought that God owed me something because of what I did. And, and maybe some of you are in that same place. Maybe you've been in that place. But I was in that place. And, and I realized it. And I got down on my knees in our bedroom. And with tears just running down my face, I gave that adult child to God. I said, God, she's yours, not mine. And, and really, that was really a... Uh, not much of a gift on my part because she's not mine anyway. She belongs to God. He created her. He died to save her. But in that moment, I was acknowledging to myself that she's not mine. And in that moment, I also acknowledged that God really doesn't owe me anything. That the thing that he owes me, he'd given me. And so I thank God for her life. I, I thank God that I get to be her father whether, what a, amount of time. That is. And in that moment, there was peace. It's this peace that I talked to you guys about that doesn't make any sense, but I began to experience that. Then last Sunday, as we wrapped up second service, if you remember at the, the end of the sermon, I talked about how we want to worship God with emotion. And if you were here at second service, you probably heard my voice start to crack a little bit and hear me uh, get a little emotional. As I went off the stage and I, I stood there uh, in my normal spot and I began to worship out loud, probably completely off key, I began to just have tears just dripping off my face as I prayed out to God through song in the song, Raise a Hallelujah. Here, here were the lyrics that I cried out in prayer to God. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. And in that moment, my joy was restored. My hope had already been restored. But in that moment, I had joy again. And I'm reminded in that moment that God was fulfilling the promises that he made. That he promised that he would forgive me of my sins if I asked him and I followed him. And that he would be with me. And even as I was reminded of, of how he doesn't owe things to go well in this life, I could feel his love in that moment. And my joy came back. Let me be clear about something. God didn't move back to me in that moment. I, I moved closer to God in that moment. God's love for me was the same before that moment than it was after that moment. But in that moment, my faith was restored. My faith was strengthened in that moment because I was reminded that I believe what I talk about. And, and look, I'm going to be real honest with you guys. I'm not where James was when James said in James chapter 1 that consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through difficulty and hardship. I'm not there. But I can tell you this. I know we grow in hardship. I know our faith is strengthened and confirmed when we go through hardship. And it's in those moments that we understand that we're devoted to prayer. Because it's woven into the fabric of our heart. We depend on it. We derive hope from it and power from being connected to our Father in heaven. Prayer needs to be as much a part of our life as eating the food that we eat that physically sustains us. It's part of praying constantly. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. He's got some very specific words here about life. He says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. If you can live that out, if you can live out the will of God, you will find hope and peace and joy in all circumstances. That's, that's one of the reasons Paul is saying, do that. But man, it's a little intimidating to talk about praying 
without ceasing. I just had this image of some dude walking down the hall, he headed to get coffee, and he's going to run into the wall over and over because he's trying to pray as he's walking through his office trying to get coffee. When I first started out in ministry at a different church, I was given the responsibility of getting up and, and talking through communion. It's the first time I'd done anything, so I'm really, really nervous. And, and so I get up on stage, and the stage had two steps coming down off the front. And so I was supposed to pray after I talked about communion. So I talk about communion, and then I start to go off the steps while I pray. Well, I'm praying, so I close my eyes. Yeah. I missed the steps and took this giant step completely off, struggled to stand, managed to stand up. The good news is everybody had their heads bowed and their eyes closed, so nobody really knew. They just heard a weird grunt in the the prayer. But I think I've gotten away with it, and then I look up at the back, and our lead worship pastor was not on stage that Sunday, so he was back in the tech booth. I see him jumping up and down and pointing at me and laughing. And I'm like, yeah, I learned something very valuable about prayer that day. You can pray with your eyes open. That works. (laughs) Being devoted to prayer means praying in lots of different circumstances and in different ways. Eyes closed, eyes open, especially when you're walking or driving. Long prayers and short prayers. It's what it means to be devoted to prayer. And and I want to use an acronym that I've used before. It's been a couple of years. And an acronym that talks about what it looks like to be devoted to prayer. And to be devoted to prayer means putting prayer first. In other words, it's the first thing that we should do at the beginning of our day. But it's also the first thing that we should do when we deal with a different circumstance in our lives. So here's the first way to be devoted to prayer by putting prayer first. Pray with frequency. Now, this one makes sense. We, we should pray a lot. It doesn't mean that we have to pray 24-7, but it does mean that prayer should be like breathing for us, as natural as that. And you think about it's way easier to breathe than it is to hold your breath because prayer is a natural, I mean, sorry, breathing is a natural thing. Prayer should be the same way. It should just happen automatically when we experience something. It should become such a part of our spiritual life that it's natural and automatic, but it's an area where every single one of us needs to continue to grow. Jesus is the God we worship, but he's also the example for us. We should follow Jesus in how we think and we talk and we live, and if we follow Jesus when it comes to prayer, we're going to pray a lot because what we see in the Bible is that Jesus prayed constantly, and he would pray in different circumstances and in different ways. He prayed when things were going well, and he prayed when things were difficult. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Luke 5, 16 says, But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Then Luke 6, 12 says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the entire night praying to God. Look at Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. We see that Jesus prayed to God the Father on a regular basis. It's part of who he was. It's not to be something at just a set time or in a set circumstance, but it's part of the fabric. It's like breathing. It's automatic and natural. All right, here's the second key to putting prayer first. You should pray with intensity. Our prayers should connect to where we're at in life at that moment. I think so often we tend to pray a little robotically because we know we're supposed to and we really don't exactly understand what we're supposed to do. So we've got this robotic prayer that we pray. That's not what it's supposed to look like. We're supposed to pray with the intensity that the circumstances would show. I want to show you what Jesus does. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's just before he's arrested and begins his final trek to the cross. And you can see his prayer and the intensity with which he prays. Look at Luke 22, 42 through 44. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus is praying with such intensity that his tears and his sweat are just running off his body like blood from an open wound. That's the example that's set for us about the intensity of prayer. When we pray for people who are lost... And there should be intensity to our prayers. That's a big deal. When we pray for healing or relief from some struggle that we are going through, we ought to pray with the intensity that that situation deserves. We, we should be burdened when we pray for our country and our world because there are lots of people 
that need to know Jesus and be transformed. Look, it's okay to bring raw emotion before Jesus when you pray. If you look back at it's the book of Psalms, man, you can see David's prayers and his songs and his, his poems that have all kinds of different intensity with happiness and sadness. If you're happy, bring that to God. If you're sad or angry, bring that to God. We worship a God who cares about where we are and cares about what we're going through. All right, we should pray with frequency and intensity. Here's the third letter. Pray with reliance on God's power. I, I think so often we kind of pray what we think God can do, and, and so we don't give him a whole lot of benefit of the doubt. Like if somebody's struggling with, say, cancer, we'll pray that the doctors would have skill when they do surgery or that the chemo and the radiation would work well in recovery. But so often we forget to just pray for God to do something amazing. And in that moment, for there to be a miracle that's obviously a miracle. can't be anything else. I, I think about this like in John chapter 11, uh, Jesus is going to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. He had been traveling uh, when he found out that Lazarus had died. And so Lazarus had been dead about three days or maybe a little more when he gets back. And so he goes to the tomb and he prays this very simple prayer. And this is John eleven forty one 41 through 42. He says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And with that simple prayer, Lazarus came walking out of the tomb. And I love here that Jesus relies on the power of God. He could have relied on his own power, but he relies on the power of God to set an example for us on what to do. And Jesus also doesn't feel the need to pray some big long prayer with all this pomp and circumstance about who God is. He just says, God, I know you can do it. Let them know you can do it. And with that, it happened. He prayed with the reliance on God's power. And some of you guys are thinking, well, okay, but that's Jesus, not me. And that's fair. I mean, that's a good thought, right? Jesus has authority that we don't have. But he is setting an example for us. And if we're going to mirror our lives to look like Jesus, then we would do what he does. The same God who raised Lazarus from the dead is the God that we pray to today. Listen to how Paul says this in Ephesians 3.20. He says that God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask him to do. And for more than we even believe is possible. And, and so I challenge you. Pray big. Pray that God would do something that's even bigger than what you could expect or you could hope for. Don't just limit prayer to things you think God can do, but pray like you know God is a big, big God, bigger than we can even understand. All right, so we should pray with reliance on God's power, but the next part of our acronym is kind of the opposite side of the coin, if you will. We're supposed to pray with submission to God's will. Pray with reliance. Pray with an expectation that God can do it. But also pray and understand that God's will is bigger than ours. His plan is greater than ours. He knows things we don't know and pray in submission. So I want to look back at this prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, just a little part of it. This is Luke 22 through 42. He says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. In other words, if there's another way for this to go down without me going to the cross, let's do it. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus prayed in submission to the will of God the Father. And he understood that that's how he had to pray, and God ultimately knows what's best. That's the way we're to pray as well. I will say this with absolute confidence. If you're going through some health struggle or difficulty, and you pray with reliance on God's power and intensity and submission to his will, and you want physical healing for some ailment, God will heal you. I promise you that. But now it may not be exactly the way you hope for. It, it may be physical healing that there's just no way to describe it except God's power. He may do it in a way without medicine. I've seen it happen. I prayed for a lady several years ago that had non-operable pancreatic cancer. And if you know much about that, that's pretty much a death sentence. And, and I prayed for her at her house with some other guys. And I didn't even know what happened. But I ran in her into her at, in, in Katie, and she recognized me three or four years later. And she was so excited. She thanked me, and she said, cancer just went away. Gone. That, that's not some miracle cure. That's just a miracle. There's no other way to describe that. But God may also choose to use doctors and medicine to bring about physical healing. That may be something that's really simple and fast. It may be months of radiation and chemo. 
But make no mistake, that's still a miracle. If you have had appendicitis and you've had your appendix removed, that's a miracle. hundred years ago, that was probably a death sentence. Infections today that are treated just like that were death sentences at one point in time. But God may not heal you physically at all in this life. You may pray desperately for relief from the cancer or some other struggle or difficulty or heart disease, and and God may not heal you physically in this life. But that doesn't mean you're not healed when you're a follower of Jesus. God makes it very clear that in heaven, there's no more pain, there's no more hurt, there's no more sickness, there's no more depression, but it will be perfect. And here's what God knows that we know, but we just don't think about. If we get 95 years in this life, just like that compared to eternity, right? 95 years, that's a good run. Compare that to a million years or a billion years. And and see, Jesus is worried less about making you comfortable here than he is preparing you for that million, billion years that you're going to spend in eternity. And, And so often when we pray for healing, we want God to do something for us. We want physical healing. But so often God is more interested in doing something in us. And maybe he even wants to do something through us to impact other people. Finally, as we look at this acronym of FIRST, we should pray with thanksgiving. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, and so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about praying with thanksgiving. But suffice it to say, we need to pray and give thanks to God when things are going well, but also when things are not going well our way. Giving thanks to God when your prayers are not being answered the way you hoped they would be is tough. My wife, as you know, has had lupus for years, and I used to pray all the time that God would heal her physically. But I'm pretty convinced that that's never going to happen in this life. And so now I, I thank God for the medicine that she has that makes her have less pain. I, I'm thankful that despite her lupus, she can run circles around me, and she takes care of our family way better than I could have ever hoped. She serves God way better than I could have expected. I, I thank God that I get another day with her, because that's not promised to me. We're to give thanks in all circumstances, even when things aren't going our way. So to be devoted to prayer, prayer's got to be first, and that looks like this. Pray with frequency, intensity, reliance on God's power, submission and thanksgiving. But the most important thing is just pray. Get started. If you're not doing it, don't be afraid of it. It's not a special prayer. You don't have to say special words. It doesn't have to be a certain amount of time. God just wants a relationship. He wants you to talk to him and tell him what's going on. All right, let's keep going. Uh, This is Colossians 4. Look at verses 3 and 4. Paul says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. You got to love what Paul says here. Paul's in prison. Notice he doesn't say, pray that I get out. He doesn't say pray for my protection or that bad stuff won't happen to me here. It's not what he says. He says, pray that even in these difficult circumstances, I can proclaim the gospel and then that I would proclaim it clearly. And that's a prayer I would ask for Chris and I, that you, you pray that we can proclaim the gospel clearly. There are people in this community that need to hear the good news of Jesus. And I just pray that God would draw people to himself and that we would proclaim that message in such a way that they would see Jesus and be changed by him. All right, look at the next passage. This is uh, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So Paul's just been talking about prayer life. But it's clear here, we're not just supposed to be locked in a closet with prayer. We're not just supposed to show up here and worship together with other believers, but we're supposed to go out into a world and share our faith. And he says, don't miss opportunities. Take every opportunity you get to share your faith. Take every opportunity you get to pray with people and invite them to church. Don't miss those because they may be the only one you get. And then he says, let your conversation be seasoned with salt. And I love that. He says, we got to make our conversations appetizing when we're talking about God and our, uh, and Christianity and our church. Food without salt is unappetizing. It's bland. People don't want to eat it. And so when we talk about our faith, we shouldn't talk like that. 
We should talk in a way that makes people want to be a part of what we do. Make it appetizing. So I would ask, think about that. How can you talk about your faith and about Jesus in such a way that makes people want to partake in it? How can you talk about your church so that people want to give it a try? All right, I'm not going to read verses 7 through 17 because this is this beautiful passage, but it, it's not, not as helpful for us because what Paul's doing here is just personal greetings. He's saying, so-and-so says hi to so-and-so. We've been praying for so-and-so. And then he says, encouraging people to continue in their faith or to share the gospel. But if you look at that passage, you can see the love that these Christians have for one another, how they miss one another when they're separated by space. And, and it's a reminder and a picture for what our love should be like for one another here at Karis City. All right, look at how Paul concludes this letter to the church in verse 18. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So Paul would have a scribe that would write his letters because he had some sort of physical ailment or disability. He called it his uh, thorn in the flesh. But at this point, at the end of the letter, Paul picks up the pen himself because he wants people to know he wrote it. These are his words. And in this final passage, there's hope, there's sadness, there's power. Think about where Paul is when he writes this. He's not only living with the loneliness and the isolation of being in prison, but he's living with the uncertainty. He doesn't know if the Roman Caesar is going to put him to death for preaching the gospel. And so that's how he writes these words. Paul says, remember my chains. He he doesn't say that because he's hoping that they'll feel sorry for him. He's not trying to get their pity. He is reminding them of what it looks like to live out of this grace. He's saying, even in prison, remember, I find joy. I'm looking to continue to serve Jesus. I want to tell people about the gospel. Follow me. Follow what I look like when I follow Jesus. Paul's story on earth would end when he was beheaded by the Roman Caesar at his direction for sharing the gospel. But that's not the end of Paul's story. Paul's in heaven right now, celebrating with Jesus, worshiping Jesus, and living out the rewards of what he did in this life. Paul knew when he wrote this sentence that the best was yet to come. I shared a little bit of my story with you over the last couple of weeks, not because I want you to feel sorry for Lil and I, because I want you to know that what I say from this stage, I believe with all my heart. I want you to know I am not perfect. I mess up all the time. I don't always live the way that I'm supposed to. But I want to be an example for you of what it looks like to live out of this new identity. I want you to know that I believe God is good. God is good when I'm fishing and I'm snorkeling in the beautiful water that I love to be in. But God is also good when I'm crying my eyes out and going through tough stuff. See, here's the mistake that you can make. You can start to think that God owes you something for following him or what you've done for him. You you can start to think that he owes you health or a marriage or a family or the right job or a certain amount of success or money. And if you do that, your faith is going to be shaken when you go through tough stuff. And you will. But if you keep your eyes fixed on him and the promise that he did make, that he'll be with you here and that the best is yet to come, if you do that, you're going to find peace even in difficulty. You're going to find hope even in uncertainty. And you're going to find joy even in loss. As followers of Jesus, here is the truth. The best is yet to come. Let's pray.